Preliminary Expectoration Part 1 by Soren Kierkegaard From Fear and Trembling Published in 1843 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org an old saying derived from the world of experience has it that he who will not work shall not eat but strange to say this does not hold true in the world where it is thought applicable for in the world of matter the law of imperfection prevails and we see again and again that he also who will not work has bread to eat indeed that he who sleeps has a greater abundance of it than he who works. In the world of matter, everything belongs to whosoever happens to possess it. It is thrall to the law of indifference, and he who happens to possess the ring also has the spirit of the ring at his beck and call, whether now he be Nuruddin or Aladdin, and he who controls the treasures of this world controls them howsoever he managed to do so it is different in the world of spirit there an eternal and divine order obtains there the rain does not fall on the just and the unjust alike nor does the sun shine on the good and the evil alike but there the saying does hold true that he who will not work shall not eat and only he who was troubled shall find rest and only he who descends into the nether world shall rescue his beloved and only he who unsheathes his knife shall be given isaac again there he who will not work shall not eat but shall be deceived as the gods deceived orpheus with an immaterial figure instead of his beloved eurydice deceived him because he was lovesick and not courageous deceived him because he was a player on the cythera rather than a man there it avails not to have an abraham for one's father or to have seventeen ancestors but in that world the saying about israel's maidens will hold true of him who will not work he shall bring forth wind but he who will work shall give birth to his own father there is a kind of learning which would presumptuously introduce into the world of spirit the same law of indifference under which the world of matter groans it is thought that to know about great men and great deeds is quite sufficient and that other exertion is not necessary and therefore this learning shall not eat but shall perish of hunger while seeing all things transformed into gold by its touch and what forsooth does this learning really know there were many thousands of contemporaries and countless men in after times who knew all about the triumphs of miltiades but there was only one whom they rendered sleepless there have existed countless generations that knew by heart word for word the story of abraham but how many has it rendered sleepless now the story of abraham has the remarkable property of always being glorious in however limited a sense it is understood still here also the point is whether one means to labor and exert oneself now people do not care to labor and exert themselves but wish nevertheless to understand the story they extol abraham but how by expressing the matter in the most general terms and saying the great thing about him was that he loved god so ardently that he was willing to sacrifice to him his most precious possession that is very true but the most precious possession is an indefinite expression as one's thoughts and one's mouth run on one assumes in a very easy fashion the identity of isaac and the most precious possession 
and meanwhile he who is meditating may smoke his pipe and his audience comfortably stretch out their legs if the rich youth whom christ met on his way had sold all his possessions and given all to the poor we would extol him as we extol all that is great i would not understand even him without labor and yet would he never have become an abraham notwithstanding his sacrificing the most precious possessions he had that which people generally forget in the story of abraham is his fear and anxiety for as regards money one is not ethically responsible for it whereas for his son a father has the highest and most sacred responsibility however fear is a dreadful thing for timorous spirits so they omit it and yet they wish to speak of abraham so they keep on speaking and in the course of their speech the two terms isaac and the most precious thing are used alternately and everything is in the best order but now suppose that among the audience there was a man who suffered with sleeplessness and then the most terrible and profound the most tragic and at the same time the most comic misunderstanding is within the range of possibility that is suppose this man goes home and wishes to do as did abraham for his son is his most precious possession if a certain preacher learned of this he would perhaps go to him he would gather up all his spiritual dignity and exclaim thou abominable creature thou scum of humanity what devil possessed thee to wish to murder thy son and this preacher who had not felt any particular warmth nor perspired while speaking about abraham this preacher would be astonished himself at the earnest wrath with which he poured forth his thunders against that poor wretch indeed he would rejoice over himself for never had he spoken with such power and unction and he would have said to his wife i am an orator the only thing i have lacked so far was the occasion last sunday when speaking about abraham i did not feel thrilled in the least now if this same orator had just a bit of sense to spare i believe he would lose it if the sinner would reply in a quiet and dignified manner why it was on this very same matter you preached last sunday but however could the preacher have entertained such thoughts still such was the case and the preacher's mistake was merely not knowing what he was talking about ah would that some poet might see his way clear to prefer such a situation to the stuff and nonsense of which novels and comedies are full for the comic and the tragic here run parallel to infinity the sermon probably was ridiculous enough in itself but it became infinitely ridiculous through the very natural consequence it had or suppose now the sinner was converted by this lecture without daring to raise any objection and this zealous divine now went home elated glad in the consciousness of being effective not only in the pulpit but chiefly and with irresistible power as a spiritual guide inspiring his congregation on sunday whilst on monday he would place himself like a cherub with flaming sword before the man who by his action tried to give the lie to the old saying that the course of the world follows not the priest's word if on the other hand the sinner were not convinced of his error his position would become tragic he would probably be executed or else sent to the lunatic asylum at any rate he would become a sufferer in this world but in another sense i should think that abraham rendered him happy for he who labors he shall not perish 
Now, how shall we explain the contradiction contained in that sermon? Is it due to Abraham's having the reputation of being a great man, so that whatever he does is great? But if another should undertake to do the same, it is a sin, a heinous sin. If this be the case, I prefer not to participate in such thoughtless laudations. If faith cannot make it a sacred thing to wish to sacrifice one son, then let the same judgment be visited on Abraham as on any other man. And if we perchance lack the courage to drive our thoughts to the logical conclusion and to say that Abraham was a murderer, then it were better to acquire that courage rather than to waste one's time on undeserved encomiums. The fact is, the ethical expression for what Abraham did is that he wanted to murder Isaac, the religious that he wanted to sacrifice him. But precisely in this contradiction is contained the fear which may well rob one of one's sleep. And yet Abraham were not Abraham without this fear. Or again, supposing Abraham did not do what is attributed to him, if his action was an entirely different one, based on conditions of those times, then let us forget him. For what is the use of calling to mind that past, which can no longer become a present reality? Or the speaker had perhaps forgotten the essential fact that Isaac was the son. For if faith is eliminated, having been reduced to a mere nothing, then only the brutal fact remains that Abraham wanted to murder Isaac, which is easy for everybody to imitate who has not the faith, the faith, that is, which renders it most difficult for him. Love has its priests in the poets, and one hears at times a poet's voice which worthily extols it. But not a word does one hear of faith. Who is there to speak in honor of that passion? Philosophy goes right on. Theology sits at the window with a painted visage and sues for philosophy's favor, offering it her charms. It is said to be difficult to understand the philosophy of Hegel. But to understand Abraham, why, that is an easy matter. To proceed further than Hegel is a wonderful feat, but to proceed further than Abraham, why, nothing is easier. Personally, I have devoted a considerable amount of time to a study of Hegelian philosophy and believe I understand it very well. In fact, I am rash enough to say that when, notwithstanding an effort, I am not able to understand him in some passages, it is because he is not entirely clear about the matter himself. All this intellectual effort I perform easily and naturally, and it does not cause my head to ache. On the other hand, whenever I attempt to think about Abraham, I am, as it were, overwhelmed. At every moment I am aware of the enormous paradox which forms the content of Abraham's life. At every moment I am repulsed and my thought, notwithstanding its passionate attempts, cannot penetrate into it, cannot forge on the breath of a hair. I strain every muscle in order to envisage the problem, and become a paralytic in the same moment. I am by no means unacquainted with what has been admired as great and noble. My soul feels kinship with it, being satisfied in all humility that it was also my cause the hero espoused, and when contemplating his deed I say to myself, Jean Tua Cusa Alcator. Footnote. Your cause too is at stake. End of footnote. I am able to identify myself with the hero, but I cannot do so with Abraham, for whenever I have reached his height, I fall down again since he confronts me as the paradox. It is by no means my intention to maintain that faith is something inferior, but, on the contrary, that it is the highest of all things. 
also that it is dishonest in philosophy to offer something else instead and to pour scorn on faith but it ought to understand its own nature in order to know what it can offer it should take away nothing least of all fool people out of something as if it were of no value i am not unacquainted with the sufferings and dangers of life but i do not fear them and cheerfully go forth to meet them but my courage is not for all that the courage of faith and is as nothing compared with it i cannot carry out the movement of faith i cannot close my eyes and confidently plunge into the absurd it is impossible for me but neither do i boast of it now i wonder if every one of my contemporaries is really able to perform the movements of faith unless i am much mistaken they are rather inclined to be proud of making what they perhaps think me unable to do namely the imperfect movement it is repugnant to my soul to do what is so often done to speak inhumanly about great deeds as if a few thousands of years were an immense space of time i prefer to speak about them in a human way and as though they had been done but yesterday and to let the great deed itself be the distance which either inspires or condemns me now if i in the capacity of tragic hero for a higher flight i am unable to take if i had been summoned to such an extraordinary royal progress as was the one on mount moriah i know very well what i would have done i would not have been craven enough to remain at home neither would i have dawdled on the way nor would i have forgot my knife just to draw out the end a bit but i am rather sure that i would have been promptly on the spot with everything in order in fact would probably have been there before the appointed time so as to have the business soon over with but i also know what i would have done besides in the moment i mounted my horse i would have said to myself now all is lost god demands isaac i shall sacrifice him and with him all my joy but for all that god is love and will remain so for me for in this world god and i cannot speak together we have no language in common possibly one or the other of my contemporaries will be stupid enough and jealous enough of great deeds to wish to persuade himself and me that if i had acted thus i should have done something even greater than what abraham did for my sublime resignation was he thinks by far more ideal and poetic than abraham's literal-minded action and yet this is absolutely not so for my sublime resignation was only a substitute for faith i could not have made more than the infinite movement of resignation to find myself and again repose in myself nor would i have loved isaac as abraham loved him the fact that i was resolute enough to resign is sufficient to prove my courage in a human sense and the fact that i loved him with my whole heart is the very presupposition without which my action would be a crime but still i did not love as did abraham for else i would have hesitated even in the last moment without for that matter arriving too late on mount moriah also i would have spoiled the whole business by my behavior for if i had had isaac restored to me i would have been embarrassed that which was an easy matter for abraham would have been difficult for me i mean to rejoice again in isaac for he who with all the energy of his soul proprio motu et proprius auspices footnote by his own impulse and on his own responsibility and footnote 
has made the infinite movement of resignation and can do no more he will retain possession of isaac only in his sorrow but what did abraham he arrived neither too early nor too late he mounted his ass and rode slowly on the way and all the while he had faith believing that god would not demand isaac of him though ready all the while to sacrifice him should it be demanded of him he believed this on the strength of the absurd for there was no question of human calculation any longer and the absurdity consisted in god's who yet made this demand of him recalling his demand the very next moment abraham ascended the mountain and whilst the knife already gleamed in his hand he believed that god would not demand isaac of him he was to be sure surprised at the outcome but by a double movement he had returned at his first state of mind and therefore received isaac back more gladly than the first time on this height then stands abraham the last stage he loses sight of is that of infinite resignation he does really proceed further he arrives at faith for all these caricatures of faith wretched lukewarm sloth which thinks oh there is no hurry it is not necessary to worry before the time comes and miserable hopefulness which says one cannot know what will happen there might perhaps all these caricatures belong to the sordid view of life which have already fallen under the infinite scorn of infinite resignation abraham i am not able to understand and in a certain sense i can learn nothing from him without being struck with wonder they who flatter themselves that by merely considering the outcome of abraham's story they will necessarily arrive at faith only deceive themselves and wish to cheat god out of the first movement of faith it were tantamount to deriving worldly wisdom from the paradox but who knows one or the other of them may succeed in doing this for our times are not satisfied with faith and not even with the miracle of changing water into wine they go right on changing wine into water is it not preferable to remain satisfied with faith and is it not outrageous that everyone wishes to go right on if people in our times decline to be satisfied with love as is proclaimed from various sides where will we finally land in worldly shrewdness in mean calculation in paltriness and baseness in all that which renders man's divine origin doubtful were it not better to stand fast in the faith and better that he that standeth take heed lest he fall for the movement of faith must ever be made by virtue of the absurd but note well in such wise that one does not lose the things of this world but wholly and entirely regains them end of preliminary expectoration part one by soren kierkegaard from fear and trembling published in 1843, translated by Lee M. Hollander.